good morning and welcome to the inaugural session of ACM India's education webinar series. All of us are still in different stages of lockdown and working from home. I hope you and your family are safe and doing well. The current pandemic has exacerbated challenges as well as inequalities in education. The pandemic is here is to stay with us and for a while, and it is causing huge disruption in education. Some of you have started teaching students online. Others are working on a hybrid model that allows for a section of students to attend school when the situation improves. We at CS Partshala would like to support you, especially during the difficult times, with some encouraging discussions through this series. I, Vipul Shah, am your host today. I head the education and skilling function at globally at Tata Consultancy Services. You also know me through CS Partial Initiative that I head. Before we start, a few things about the webinar. The audience will be in silent mode all the times. However, that does not mean that we do not interact. You can log your questions at any time using the Q&A window. We'll take questions at the end of the talk and try to address as many questions as possible. We will, however, be limited by the time of 60 minutes allotted to this webinar. Since CS Partial is an ACM India initiative, it's only fair that we spend a couple of minutes to understand what ACM and CS Partial are all about. This, is, is, this slide is ACM India in a nutshell. ACM membership means being part of the world's largest computing society. ACM has been at the forefront of computing education, having founded Computer Science Teachers Association in the US, CS Partial in India, and undergraduate CS curricula among many other initiatives. ACM India is involved in several education initiatives, and CS Partiala is one of them. Launched in 2016 to promote computational thinking in schools, our vision is that every child should learn computing by 2030. Our efforts on advocacy are paying off, and the draft national education policy recognizes the importance of teaching computational thinking and recommends that it be taught from age six onwards. In fact, 30,000 government schools in Tamil Nadu are learning CT as part of a revised mathematics curriculum. Additionally, 300,000 students are learning CT using CS Partshala curriculum and teaching aids that have been provided for free. A large number of teachers have been trained on CT. Importantly, working with large number of rural schools and students from weaker sections of the society, our focus has been to make computing available to those who have been traditionally deprived. Final, finally, I would like to thank all the volunteers and partners who have been on this journey with us. We could not have asked for a better speaker to inaugurate the series. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Tim Bell. Tim is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Software Engineering at University of Canterbury, New Zealand. His Computer Science Unplugged project is being widely used internationally and has been translated in over 25 languages. I was introduced to CS Unplugged maybe 10 or 11 years ago. The concept of teaching CS without computers just blew me away, and I wish CS Unplugged was available 35, 40 years ago when I was in school. Tim has received many awards for his work in computing education, including the 2018 ACM 6 CSE Outstanding Contribution to Computer Science Education Award. He is actively involved in design and deployment of the approach to the teaching of digital technology in New Zealand schools. Really speaking, Tim needs no introduction to this audience. All of you already know him through your favorite magic trick, the parity bit activity that you perform with your students for error detection and correction. So again, warm welcome to Tim, and over to you. Great. Well, thank you for, for such a warm welcome. Um, it's a real privilege to be with you. I'm uh, actually... Uh, with you in spirit, I'm actually down in New Zealand, of course, and I, th I thought I should start by just uh, doing a little bit of geography. So um, you're up in the Northern Hemisphere there, and I'm down in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, where it's nighttime and it's a very cold, uh, rain rainy day here. So, uh, But uh, I'm sending warm greetings to you and uh, really excited to be able to spend time with you. Uh, the... My hope today is uh, maybe give you a few ideas that will help you to think about things a bit differently, maybe reinforce a few things about what you do. The first thing I'm going to show you is something that we're 
we're very we're proud of lots of things in New Zealand. We're proud of our cricket team, for example, uh, and that's something we have in common. Uh, but we also uh, quite like to draw the map this way around. It's a different way of thinking about uh, the world, but there's no reason that it needs to be uh, with the Northern Hemisphere at the top. Uh, so here we have Christchurch nearly at the top of the world, uh, and we worry about everyone down under there that you might have to hold on in case you fall off the bottom of the world. Well, uh, this is going to be an interactive. We're going to make it as interactive as possible. And so I'm going to actually start uh, with a question uh, just to get a feeling for who is here. So hopefully, if this works well, uh, then uh, you can click on the screen and just let us know uh, what your role is. Uh, we've only given uh, a, a few options there, but uh, and I know that many of you will be in multiple roles uh, or probably something outside of this even, and uh, but just gives me a little bit of a feel of who's here today. I always prefer to be there in person, but uh, of course at the moment it's just a wee bit complicated to organise. Okay, so I'll try my luck and see how this is coming in. Oh, fantastic. So uh, basically we've got a lot of teachers uh, and I'm always excited to talk to teachers. Um, everywhere I go around the world, teachers always have one thing in heart and that is their students. And uh, it's uh, so just thank you in advance for caring about your students and for taking this time on a Saturday to, to find out more. Good to see that we have some industry professionals here and of course volunteers who uh, do marvellous work. So. Uh, that's really good. And if you're just interested, if you just happened by, or you thought you were coming to something else, you're very welcome. We'll try and have some fun together. So about 30 years ago, um, I got involved in this thing called Computer Science Unplugged. It wasn't a thing back then. In fact, I, um, I'd been asked to speak at my son's uh, school class. Uh, he was five years old. He's actually he's just turned 33. So uh, it gives you an idea how long ago it was. And he... Um, I wanted to speak to this class of primary school children, but I couldn't figure out what I could get them to do on a computer, and there weren't really any computers around for them to use or anything. So I thought, let's be radical, let's do something without computers. And that very quickly grew into this thing called Computer Science Unplugged, doing activities without a computer. Now, we're not advocating that you never use computers. It's really fun to do programming. It's fun to make things happen on computers. But this is a way to get in the door. It's a way to do something quickly with students to get them engaged. And I'll talk a bit more about what, what that all is about. Um, but I just want to begin by acknowledging uh, my colleague, Mike Fellows. Um, so again, you know, about nearly th three decades ago, when I was uh, working on this, uh, I had posted something on the internet about what I was doing, and there was a bit of interest. But uh, Mike replied, and we ended up uh, getting together and pooling all the ideas that we have and producing this thing that we ended up calling Unplugged. Uh, and now, today, Unplugged is it means a few different things. We have a website with lots of activities on it. Uh, there's some books, there's videos, there's all sorts of stuff. But it's also just become a style of teaching, uh, a style where you interact, you get away from the computer and uh, do things off the computer, which might seem a bit strange. You know, we're teaching computer science without computers. I'm going to give you a quote that uh, it, Mike um, actually wrote this in 1991, uh, where he said, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. Now, I wish I had a live audience, because I imagine a few of you are thinking, hang on a minute, didn't Dijkstra say that? Uh, well, it's true that Dijkstra said that, but he said it in 1993, um, and he made the, the quote very famous. But uh, in, we, we're pretty sure that uh, Mike was the first person who came up with the idea. Uh, and uh, either way, it's a really useful thing um, to think about, that computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. Now, if we think about that, um, you, you imagine if you went to do an astronomy class and they spent all their time looking at telescopes. Uh, it's not really what it's about, and it's the same with computer science. And I'll, I'll look in a minute uh, at what we really mean by that, but it's something to think about. Uh, just one other character I need to introduce is Arnold the Wonder Parrot. Arnold um, joined the Unplugged crowd uh, probably 25 years ago when one of my students was doing the, that magic parrot trick, which uh, sounds like a few of you have seen before. Uh, and he brought in this parrot uh, as a joke, just to say that it's a parrot, parrot trick, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and Arnold has been part of computer science unplugged ever since. So he's often used as a model when we need to photograph someone. 
Now, I'm going to take a bit of a risk here. I'm going to try doing an activity interactively with you. We'll see how we go. And it's one that uh, some of you may have done before. And this is getting students to have a look at binary numbers, binary digits. How do you represent things using just two values? Uh, and we do it using cards. Sometimes we get uh, students up the front like they are here. Or um, sometimes uh, it's it's better to have them uh, just on a on the desk, some cards that are laid out uh, like a kind of a game. But I'm going to try doing it over the internet. And so let's just uh, see how I can, if I can make this work. Uh, I am going to share a screen with you, which um, so hopefully you'll be able to see uh, this one with the uh, black cards on it. Just let it come up. And I'll make it a wee bit bigger. And normally when we give this out to students, and I normally have a bit more interaction here, but uh, we, we have the one, ask them to look at the one on the right, and of course it's got one dot on it, and then the next one has two dots on it, and we ask them how many dots are on the next one. Now this is the really interesting thing, because um, you probably know that it's meant to be four, but if a student says there's going to be four dots, then they have probably seen this before. Almost every student will say three dots. Now, this is a way of teaching, um, it's a constructivist way of teaching, where we're letting the student construct the knowledge for themselves. So we don't tell them that it's going to be four dots. They predict that it's going to be three. Then we just turn it over, and they see the four dots. And, and usually, if you've tried this, you'll know that there's a bit of murmuring, and they're going, oh, you made a mistake. You left one out or something like that. And we go, no, we'll just leave it at that. And then we say, what do you think the next one will be? Now, if you've been teaching, uh, you're probably aware that a lot of students will think that the next one after that, they see the pattern two, four, and they'll go, oh, it's, it's a six. But there will probably be one student in the class who will go, no, no, it's eight. They can see the pattern. And then you ask them to explain the pattern, and they'll probably say something about doubling or two of this card is the same as the next card or something like that. Um, and it's, again, to be con constructivist, you're letting them explain to you that each card has got twice as many dots as the previous one. And usually at this point, most of the students will instantly know, oh, the, the next one is going to be 16. And sometimes it's really hard to stop them. And, you know, they'll be going 32, 64, and uh, just go on and on. And that's absolutely fine. It's, uh, it's really neat to you know, see them getting engaged. But they have explained the pattern to you rather than you explain it to them. Now, what we're going to do is use these cards to um, represent some number of dots. And like most of the unplugged activities, one of the key ideas is that there's very little that you have to tell them. I've been talking a lot, uh, mainly because I can't see and hear you. But normally all I'd have done is ask them how many dots on the cards. They'd have told me the pattern. And then I go, OK, there's just one rule. Each card is either visible or it's not visible. and that, that's the only rule that we have to give them. We don't give them any instructions on how to do things. Um, but then I ask them the question, I would like to have exactly 11 dots visible. Okay, so uh, we're going to go for 11 dots. And so I will ask them, and I'm going to make this into a poll for you, um, should I have the 16 one visible or not visible? So over to you. Now, I want you to imagine that you're students in a class, maybe pretend you've seen this for the first time, uh, but do you want the, dot, the, the, the card with the 16 dots visible? And I'll have a look at the votes on that. So most of you don't want it visible at the moment. Well, actually, when I say most, that's 33%. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing I didn't quite give enough time. Let's just uh, revisit that. Oh, we've got a 50-50. <laughs> OK. So normally, if we want to have um, 11 dots visible, then the students will pretty quickly realize that if the 16 is visible, it's always going to be too many. Okay, so let's, we'll give that a no to the 16. And I'll go to this next poll. And forgive me if I'm not giving you enough time to react. But anyway, I still want 11 dots. Um, should the 8 one be visible in order to get 11 dots in total visible? We're going to be hiding. I'll ask you about the other ones in a minute. But do you want the one with 8 dots visible? Just give you a minute to interact on that. One of the neat things about interacting over the internet is that it really is making the point that you have binary communication with me. There are only two things that you can send to me. Um, but let me f find out uh, what the decision is. 
Okay, so now we've got a big vote for yes, that uh, the eight should be visible. So I'll go with that. Um, and I'll leave the eight visible. And so now the next question for you, not surprisingly, is should this card, the one with four dots on it, be visible? Give you a minute to vote on that. Remember, I want 11 dots in total. So do you want the four to be visible? Okay. Well, I'm not sure if my polling system is working correctly here. I'll just um, give another chance for people to poll on that. But if we have the four card visible and I want 11 dots in total, then, um, okay, yeah, we are getting a few votes for no now. Um, you really don't want that visible. And the students will soon reason, well, if I had eight dots and four dots visible, then that would be too many. I'd have 12 dots and you only want 11. Okay. So let's uh, go to the next question, um, which is, do you want this card with the two dots visible? Shall I hide it like that? Or shall I have it visible? Because I want 11 dots in total. And I'll let you give me your yes, no answer. OK, so lots of votes for it should be visible. And apologies if I haven't allowed enough time for that, but uh, it, we'll, we'll just do the one card now. So the next, the, the final question is, do you want this card here to be visible or invisible to get 11 dots in total? It's probably a fairly simple question by this stage. Just about a minute, half a minute for the voting. Right, so everyone, well not everyone, most, most of you want it visible, and that's fine. So in a very roundabout way, what we've done is your responses to the poll were, um, when, when I had all of these cards, were um, no, yes, no, yes, yes. Now, by communicating that, uh, you communicated to me the number 11, and I can communicate a number to you. Um, so for example, the month in which I was born is no, yes, no, yes, no. Um, so if the students quickly work out, well, that's representing 10, and 10, maybe that represents the month of October, so maybe you were born in October and so on. Um, now, all of this is explained in the, in the um, online lesson plans for Unplugged, so I won't go over in a lot of detail, um, but there's a, just a couple of points I want to make. One is that traditionally when we teach about binary numbers, we talk about powers of two, you know, two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, and uh, maybe we compare it with decimal numbers, 10 to the one, 10 to the two, 10 to the three, and so on. But for young students, we don't need that. We just need these cards and some very simple rules that you flip the card over or it's not visible. That's that's about all it is. And there's so much you can then do with that. You can think about what's the largest number, how to count using these things and so on. And uh, the other thing is, you know, if I had 16 cards, what would that go up to? And so here's the version with 16 cards. And uh, suddenly we're going up to, um, 65,000. And, and you know, a lot of it is no one will probably ever need to convert a binary number, you know, for in their life for any particular, you know, important purpose. But what we're trying to teach them is that there are limits, you know, if I only allow eight bits for a binary number, I can't go past 255 when I count, it's going to overflow and so on. Um, but it's also got this exponential representation power. If I have a 128-bit uh, key for in, in encryption, then 129 bits is twice as strong. You know, there's twice as many values and so on. So there's all sorts of stuff um, that we can get following up on that. Um, one of the things we soon ask the students is, how would you represent letters using the, the digits? Again, in a constructivist way, we ask them to tell us. We don't tell them A is 1, B is 2. But usually you will find the students coming up with the idea that they could use A for 1 and B for 2 or something like that. And I just go with whatever system they come up with and we start using that to communicate only by saying yes and no. Or um, there was one group I was working with and they decided they wanted to use quack and moo as the two sounds. So you could go quack, moo, quack, quack, moo, and transmit a letter of the alphabet, transmit messages. And then it raises questions like, how many letters are there in the alphabet? What alphabet do we need? Because this is the English alphabet, but that's not the alphabet that everyone uses. And so, you know, there are a lot of different things that we can communicate with that. Um, sometimes we follow up by 
Um, you can do artwork, for example, these beads. We have the white and blue beads, zeros and ones, so you can represent your initials or your name uh, in beads and you know have hidden messages and so on. Uh, and we even hide messages in songs and things like that. But the important thing is that when they, we're not teaching them to be good at converting binary numbers. We're teaching them to appreciate the patterns, the beauty, the limits, um, the power of it um, for representing color and letters and all sorts of things like that. And the idea that whatever they deal with in the future, you know, maybe it will become common to send smell uh, between computers. Uh, and if so, it will be binary numbers that represent it. So that's just an example of unplugged at work and especially you know, how I found the most successful way to work with it. Um, I just want to step back a wee bit and think about what are we up to here. And a, um, a psychologist called Albert Bandura once said this, which I think is really helpful to, to put context on it. He said, everyday life is increasingly regulated by complex technologies and most people neither understand nor believe that they can do much to influence what's happening. And I think a lot of students and a lot of young people, certainly where I am in New Zealand, um, see this as something that they do. You know, they have invented something that can recognize faces. They are going to invent cars that can drive themselves or whatever the next cool thing is. But as teachers, you have to realize that they are people who are sitting in your classes at the moment some of those kids are going to be the ones who end up inventing the next cool thing. Um, and so we want, when we look at this quote, we think about these complex technologies. Well, they're not really all that complex. There's, there's a lot of layers there. There's a lot going on. But by breaking it down and helping them understand it, then it, it, it empowers them to, first of all, feel that they can understand it. And hopefully they can influence. If they don't like the way it's going, Maybe they can improve it. Maybe they can even, you know, develop a new idea that will be, you know, help society or, um, you know, be something that will be very popular. So I want to talk about computational thinking for a minute. And I'll just um, unshare my screen. So uh, with computational thinking, the idea uh, it's an idea that became popular around 2006, uh, but it's actually been around for a long time. Uh, but a woman called uh, Jeanette Wing uh, made, uh, wrote a paper in, the, in communications of the ACM, actually, uh, in which she really um, brought it to the fore. And one of her definitions is computational thinking is thinking like a computer scientist. Now, that doesn't always help people a lot because how does a computer scientist think? What, what is computer science about? Um, and the interesting thing for me is that when we were working on computer science unplugged, that was exactly the point of what I was trying to do. Um, the reason I was invited to speak at my son's school is that they were inviting all the parents to come along each week and a, a different parent would come and talk about what they did for a living and why they liked their jobs to, just to get the students thinking about all the different jobs that they might be able to do. And so I had to go along and explain what is it to be a computer scientist. And so a lot of the unplugged material was designed to um, enable people to, to enable young students to understand, um, you know, what a computer scientist thinks about. Not by telling them, but by letting them do the thinking. Okay, so um, let's unpack that a wee bit. I'm, I'm going to give an example that might be fairly familiar, I hope. So one is that if you are um, searching for something, you might use uh, a search engine like Google. Now, the learning to use that is pretty straightforward. Writing some software to do it is a whole different thing. And so computer programming is that act of making the software. Now, it's actually not too hard to write a computer program that does searching. The program, you could write a simple program that just takes a whole lot of data and goes through it one item after the other and just checks that each one matches. Now, those of you who know much about computing will know that that would be extremely slow. If a search engine was built on that, it might take weeks or even months to do your search for you. You know, you type in a search and then you'd come back a few months later and see the answer. And that's not going to work. So computer programming isn't enough. It's not enough just to be able to implement something in software. So what a computer scientist needs to think about 
is a whole lot of other aspects of this. And in particular, well, actually, I'll just start. When you type in something like, why are computer scientists into Google, you get some pretty interesting answers. Uh, why are they important? Why are they rich? I like that one. Uh, the last one, not so interesting, why computer science scientists are loners. Um, although, actually, if you go to it, it actually says that computer scientists are more likely to get married than other people. So that's OK. But what we're thinking about when we in build a search engine is that it has to be fast. No one is going to wait for two months to get the replies. It has to be efficient. Uh, Google have warehouses full of computers doing these calculations for them. And if it takes more uh, computation than it should, it will, they need more computers. It will use more power. It will use more time. It has to be reliable. Um, you know, if you write an app, people will need to rely on it. Otherwise, they won't use it. It has to be secure. Uh, most people don't want all the things that they've used in the search engine to ever be able to come, become public. Okay? So security is important for most applications. It has to be usable. It has to be easy to use. Um, you just go to the app and you should just be able to see how to work it. Um, it has to be scalable. If you suddenly have 10 times as many customers or 1,000 times as many customers, it needs to be able to scale up um, to work for that. And it even needs to be intelligent. In this case, predicting what I might be about to search for right, to save me having to type the whole thing in. So all of these different aspects are things that computer scientists think about. And uh, that gives us a bit of an idea about how that's more than just learning to program. So I thought I'd give a little bit of history of uh, where uh, Computer Science Unplugged came from uh, using a particular approach, uh, a particular activity we have called the Parallel Sorting Network. Now, when I first started working with Mike Fellows, that was around 1993, and he was running an event called Mathmania where he had drawn the sorting network on the ground uh, using spray paint. But actually, I will just um, briefly, and some of you may well have seen this before, um, but I'm going to um, just quickly show you um, some sorting networks in action, if I can bring it up. So if this has come up correctly, uh, the um, what we have here is uh, a network marked out on the ground. In this case, it's marked out using tape. And the students are holding six numbers. The sorting network basically has these rules that you follow the lines. And when you meet together, you compare the two numbers that you have. And the smaller number follows the line out to the left. And the larger number follows the line out to the right. Very simple rule. But then if everyone does it at the same time and they follow the lines on the ground, then Eventually, at the end, you end up with all of the numbers sorted into order. Now, that might seem fairly simple, but for students, it's quite magic. Um, and the, these really simple rules, and again, with Unplugged, we don't explain lots of things. We just say, when you meet, you compare your numbers, smaller to the left, larger to the right, and then they do it. Now, there might be some confusion at first. They may teach each other. That's always a good thing. Um, but eventually, they should be able to figure out um, how to make it work. So going back to um, 1993, in fact, Mike Fellows um, decided to use this activity because he had just been teaching it uh, to a senior class. And uh, he was wondering what to do with students. And he thought, actually, this, this could be um, really good to do with my own students. And so um, he um, took it uh, and drew it on the ground, and the rest is history. Um, by 1998, we were using it for shows, had students sorting all sorts of things. Um, there's quite a few online demonstrations of it. And by the way, with this, it's really cool if you can do it outside. Um, chalk on the ground is really good if you're able to do that and mark it out. Sometimes it's drawn on tarpaulins if, if you need a flat surface. And the bigger it is, the better. The students are running around. They're getting exercise. Um, and they're thinking, but most importantly, they are getting some of the excitement of what it means to be a computer scientist. They are doing computational thinking. So it stopped me coming into the class and saying, I'm a computer scientist, I enjoy my job, let me tell you why I enjoy it. 
it's me coming in and saying, let's do this activity. If you like thinking about things that way, you're starting to think like a computer scientist. And for me, it's way more important that we actually give them a vision of what it's about. But also, because they've participated, they're actually starting to feel that maybe I understand this myself. Maybe I would like to learn more about it myself. Uh, here's one of the larger ones that uh, I've seen. It's a 12-way sorting network. So that was really large, uh, done in Japan. Um, here's one that Mike Fellows did in India, actually, I think, with a, a visit as, as part of the um, CS Pathshala uh, program. And one of the neat things with this is that we've been doing this for nearly three decades, but students still come up with neat ideas. Um, this is one that I, a photo I took at a local school recently, and it's the, the children have drawn pictures on it. That's fine. Um, they've done it so often um, that they can draw the entire network from memory on the ground. But also notice the lines that squiggle around, um, particularly that one on the, on the top left-hand side, because what the students realize is that person gets to the end very quickly. And so they make the line go round and round to get there to slow the person down. From a computer science point of view, it doesn't change the rules at all. It's exactly the same uh, topology, and it has exactly the same result, but it's more fun. And they quite enjoy having these things sometimes sort of go around and come back and all sorts of things like that. So we can learn a lot from the students. And over the years, quite often, they've asked us questions, and we go, oh, I don't know why that is. I have to go and work it out. Or even, that's a really good idea. I'm going to do that next time I do this activity. So. Um, you know, it's a two-way thing. We learn from the students as well. The other thing is that we use it uh, for sorting all sorts of things. So in the top left-hand corner here, you can see that the students are comparing much larger numbers. That can actually be quite hard. I mean, you have to, you know, look at a digit at a time. Sometimes we give them fractions or, or decimal numbers to compare as well. Uh, on the right hand, or the, the bottom one here, they're comparing letters of the alphabet. And... That, of course, immediately you have to ask the students, how do we compare letters of the alphabet? Is the letter A before or after B? And then suddenly they realize that um, you know, there is an order to letters of the alphabet. And it is quite hard to compare. You know, is the letter Q before or after the letter H? You have to really think about it, particularly for young students. And then on the top right, they're comparing the authors of these books. So they have a book and they're comparing the names of the authors and sorting them into alphabetical order. The bottom right one, uh, they are sorting music. And so what they have here are musical notes that are being represented, and they have to work out which note is the high note and which note is the low note. And the low one goes left and the high one goes right. And again, that's used in a music lesson, and the students are learning um, about music. So... I'll just see if I can play a, a little bit of a video of uh, one of my favorite ones. It, uh, the audio may not come out so well here, uh, but this is available online and I'll make sure that, um, that these are available. Um, so just need to bring it up here. And apologies for the little pause. Actually, that's not worked so well. Let's just try it a different way. Ah, right, here we are. So um, in, what's happened here is the students have um, bells, hand bells, and as they go through, they shake the bell, they listen for which note is the higher or the lower note. Yeah, which is actually quite hard for them to do. But it makes a lovely sound, and at the end, hopefully they have the bells all in order. Yeah. Now, sometimes they need a bit of help um, to be able to compare the notes, but you can see that anything that can, can be compared that has a higher and a lower, a first and a later, you know, earlier, later, we can actually sort using the sorting network. Okay, so there are some examples. Um, one of the things I want to point out is that 
all of this material is free. Uh, so it's under a Creative Commons license. Uh, it's freely available and the, um, there's no charge for it. You can download it. Uh, it's one of the reasons we've ended up with so many translations too, is that it's been very easy for people um, to be able to do a translation. Um, just want to talk about one other topic that uh, you might be familiar with, you might not, but it's sorting algorithms. What, the way we've done this is that uh, we use a balance scale to compare two different values. And so the students um, have these weights. The weights all look identical, but they are all different. And so they have to weigh them against each other to see which is the heaviest. And normally the very first challenge that we give them is find the heaviest one of them all. Now, to do that, if they've got, I think she's got 11 weights there, uh, she'll have to do 10 comparisons of, to figure out which one is the heaviest. And then we say, well, put that to one side and then figure out what's the second heaviest weight. And very quickly, they, they'll be able to sort things into order. Now, I haven't really got time to explain this in detail, but for those of you who are familiar with this, I just want to point out that it's not that the student needs to learn another sorting algorithm, but we want to think about how long does it take. And so in particular, if I had asked that girl to sort in weights, then it would have taken her uh, nine comparisons to find the heaviest of 10, and then eight, and then seven, and, and you need to add them all up, and you could work out that total. Now, some of you may be familiar with um, Gauss's trick, where you add the list of numbers in reverse, and of course, each of those values is the same. And so we can quickly work out that the total of those is nine lots of 10, but we have to halve it because every number's been added twice. And so we end up being able to calculate that that girl will have to make 45 comparisons to get the weights into order. At this point, I ask the students, suppose instead of 10 items, I have 100 items. And remember that we're interested in scalability. What if you do have 10 times as many things uh, sometime? And so the, what, what do you think the students would say? It takes 45 comparisons to sort 10 items. How many comparisons to sort 100? Well, they will probably say it's 10 times as much to do, so it will take 10 times as long, 45 comparisons. But then if you do the calculation, um, and I won't do it in detail now, but essentially you end up with working, well, it's 99 times 100 over 2, or 4,950 comparisons. That is not 10 times as many. In fact, it's more than 100 times as many. And that's one of the big things that we want to teach about algorithms, is that if you give an algorithm twice as much to do, it could take four times as long to do it. And that's not very good value for money. So we want to look for an algorithm that is more efficient. Uh, and that's a real surprise to a lot of students. They would you know, make assumptions that um, everything's proportional, that if you've got twice as much to do, it will take twice as long. But the thing I really want to emphasize is we're not teaching them how to do all these algorithms. Yes, they will probably figure them out, but we're teaching them that some algorithms are more efficient than others. And even just what is an algorithm? Well, to finish off with, I'm gonna um, ask the question, does it work? <laughs> it's a lot of fun, it's very popular, Lots of people use it. Um, and one of the points I want to make before looking at the research is to point out, point out that any pedagogical approach can be delivered badly with little effort. Now, that's a slightly ambiguous statement, but <coughs> excuse me, there are many ways that you can, you, you can have a wonderful idea to teach, but if you put little effort in, if you don't think it through, if you don't prepare it, or if you don't think about the best way to engage the students with it, then it may not have the impact that you'd like it to have. So just because it, you know, it's a good idea, it is possible to do it badly. And I've had that experience where I've had you know, really good experiences teaching some groups, and then I get lazy or I, I try a different way and I realize that I haven't really done it quite so well. But let's look at Unplugged in particular and the research on it. First of all, um, there was a paper published in 2011, um, and you notice it was with high school students. And it was a bit disappointing because they said the program had no statistically significant impact on student attitudes. 
um, or understanding. Now, that sounds a bit worrying, but what I found out is that they had done the unplugged with no follow-up, without putting it in any context, without any programming, without linking it to computers. And when you think about it, that's pretty inevitable because if you're running around the playground, having fun, if you're flipping cards, doing patterns, why would a student associate that with computers? Why would they realize that this is something that helps to make websites go really fast, that helps us to build apps that are really useful? There's no connection there. So some later work um, that I think is particularly interesting though, um, but here is um, where the researchers ran two different classes. They divided the students into two different groups. And one group had, um, both groups had eight lessons, but one group had four lessons using Unplugged and then four lessons programming. The second group had eight lessons programming. Which group do you think was better at programming? The one with eight lessons on programming or four lessons on programming? Well, the answer is kind of interesting because both groups were equally good at programming, but the ones that had had less time learning to program had higher self-efficacy. In other words, they actually felt better about themselves as programmers, and they'd learned less programming because they had done some time with Unplugged. They also had a bigger vocabulary. They, they knew more blocks. They were using the Scratch language. So the interesting thing here is that they were better off for doing four weeks of Unplugged and then four weeks of programming than the whole time programming. And I think what had happened, and nobody knows for sure, but from experience, it makes sense that the four weeks, they really got thinking about things. They got thinking about patterns. They got thinking about what was important. And then when they were on the computer, they were able to do, uh, do that, and they felt that they knew that what they were doing a lot better. So we don't know for sure, but it does seem that um, unplugged on its own is not great. Programming on its own, not great, but putting them together can be quite powerful. And then uh, I'll just mention one other piece of research. This was about introducing teachers to computational thinking uh, by um, Kurtzen and some colleagues in England. And he found that using Unplugged inspired and gave confidence to teachers, and it gave them a greater understanding of the concepts involved. So it's actually, we, at the moment, we have a lot of teachers, and many of you are probably in that position, who are starting to get involved in teaching computer science and programming. Uh, and we found that the Unplugged approach is a really good way to get teachers involved, um, because it's a familiar uh, situation, you know, chalk, cards, walking around, playground, uh, asking questions and so on. Um, and it's not half as scary as they might, might have thought it was. As a result of that, one of the things that, that we have done is on the Computer Science Unplugged site, uh, we have a section called Plugging It In. And in fact, what I might do is just, again, uh, screen, screen share the, the website. Um, the... So when you go to a, a lesson plan, so here's the one that has got, for example, the parity magic uh, in it, then you'll notice that they've got some programming challenges over here. And so as well as finding out how to do the magic trick or this is um, how to do something with uh, product codes, if you click on the, the programming challenges, then it takes you to something with a list of things that the students could try out. And with the, the parity challenge, you're, you're looking, well, the first thing you need to do is be able to count uh, the number of squares. So just a very simple program here. Um, the challenge to the students is, you know, create a program that counts how many black or white squares there are. And they can actually see it working in Scratch. Uh, we give them recommended blocks. We say, um, so ideally they don't use this, but if they have to, they could look at this and say, okay, these are the kind of things I could use to write the program. Now we do actually provide a solution we put it two steps away and we make it a little bit hard for them to just view it and they can't copy and paste it, but we do show them a, one program that, that uh, would solve the problem. And so we're still doing some research on this, but we think that if they do the activity physically, then they can have fun with that. And then we follow it up with a programming exercise and that matches the research that I was just talking about. So it would be interesting to see um, how that works, but. The, the, the initial um, results we have is are very promising. It looks like it'll be a good idea. And just one other website we've produced um, that I want to mention is what we call the Computer Science Field Guide. 
Um, and that's a version uh, that's intended for older students. It's more like a textbook. Um, so in fact, the card trick that I was showing you was from that. Uh, you can use it on your own. Um, it's more fun when you do the unplugged things with other people than you're running around. Um, but if, um, but in a textbook kind of mode, students can use the site on their own. And I want to finish um, just with uh, a quote that, it's a quite an old quote, but it, um, I just want to share that, uh, which is uh, from a woman called Edna Kerr, who said, the greatest tragedy I know of is so many young people never discover what they really want to do. I think um, I, I began by saying, you know, teachers have at their heart their students. And I think one of the things that really drives teachers is helping their students to discover what they really want to do. And I wouldn't think for a minute that everyone wants to be a computer scientist, but I do want them to find out what it is to be a computer scientist, because I don't think it's terribly well understood. And if they uh, really enjoy it, then we've inspired them to do that. And if they think, well, that was interesting, but it's not for me, that's great too, because they've, they've made a decision based on what it is. So here are the websites I've been talking about. Um, the videos and all of the activities and so on I've used are available through those. Um, and I'll, I'll finish up there, and I th hopefully we've got time for some questions. But uh, I'll, yeah, how are we going? Thank you very much, Tim. I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I think the idea that people who will bring about change are in front of you is quite important. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing which I heard was we can learn a lot from students. I think both of these are very, very important points you made. Uh, one thing which I really need to share uh, with my boss is your comment that computer scientists are rich. I think he needs to know, understand that, right? <laughs> so uh, I think Tim, every time I hear you, I learn something new. Uh, so let us start with a few questions. Uh, I think the first one I have is from Chetan. His question is, is computational thinking just a particular approach towards problem solving? Ah, right. Yeah, well, the, the whole area of computational thinking is actually almost a little controversial. Um, in some ways, uh, when, particularly in America, they wanted to get uh, programming into schools, trying to sell just programming or coding uh, as a subject, it's very narrow and it, it sounds a, a little odd, whereas computational thinking is broader. Um, and it is just a way of thinking, um, but it's not just a way of thinking. I think one of the things that's become clear is it's a way of thinking that you get a computer to do the work for you. And so then you have to think about, well, what is a computer and what can a computer do? And there are limits to what a computer can do. Um, it can only follow certain kinds of instructions. Uh, and there's a whole philosophy you know, lecture there about you know, what, what can a computer do and, and so on. Um, but basically, if you, it's what can you write in a program. And so it's taking an idea and turning it into a computer program would be one way of thinking about it. Um, it but there's all sorts of other aspects because, for example, we're really interested in the person who's going to use the program. Um, have we written a program that they can understand that will make sense to them and so on? So there's many different aspects to it. Uh, and I think we're still deciding on exactly how we would define it. I actually um, uh, was co-authored a chapter about this recently. So um, I might be able to share a link afterwards or something uh, about that. But it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of discussion and writing about it. Mm. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, from Tapas. How would the concept be fruitful in rural India? Ah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll just preface it by saying, of course, I don't have any experience working in rural India, although um, Mike Fellows, my colleague, has. And I think, I mean, one of the good things is that you don't need many materials at all. And um, in fact, I, um, I've seen some photos from India where people have been very resourceful and used what's available locally. Uh, and that in itself is a, a great exercise in creativity. Uh, so it means that students can do some meaningful thinking, um, even if computers aren't available uh, or if they have to share and they don't have too much opportunity to use them. Um, the, the important thing, though, we know from the research is that you do need to connect that with the idea that it is going to end up being something that's done on computers. And that's what I, I don't, I probably can't help so much, but how do you help students visualize 
what that might mean um, to, to actually be able to do something on a computer. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think the next question is from Priyanka. Her question is on the activity you did uh, when you were counting 11 with dots. And her uh, question was, uh, question is, why did you begin with the higher number, 16 dots? Uh, why not that's... begin with a card with a single dot and go up asking students whether to hide the card or not? Yes, that, that, that is a really good question, actually. Um, and in fact, uh, so I'll just bring, bring up the dots again. Um, you could do it either way. And in fact, it would be fun to do it both ways with the students, I think. It, it will help them think about it. Um, the reason I start at the top is that it's usually very obvious to the students. So when I say I want a total of 11 dots and they see the 16 there, it's absolutely obvious that they should hide that. Um, and so for a human, it's easier to go left to right because, in fact, it ends up being that the decision about each one is, is it too much or not enough? So 16 is too much, we lose it. Eight, eight is not enough to get 11, so we keep it there. Four, that will make it too much, so we leave it, we get rid of it. Two, that makes it up to 10, so that stays there, one, and then we're done. And so that simple algorithm uh, will always work. If we start at the other end, um, then with the one, then we well, technically the question is, is it an odd number? Uh, 11 is an odd number, so I'll leave that in, but it's a little bit more difficult. So I've always found starting at the left-hand side, quite young students can make the decisions fairly easily. Now, the way I presented it today was probably a bit fast, and I don't know if the poll was quite giving you a chance to um, do, make the decisions, but yeah, left to right is a lot easier for students. If you need to write a computer program for it, right to left is probably easiest. Um, and in fact, in the plugging it in, um, we have both ways of doing it. So we encourage the students to write a program that will go left to right and from right to left. And uh, they, they're good exercises. Thank you. I think the next question is something which I had too, is there's a lot of face-to-face -face interaction in CS and Plug. How do we pivot it in the current pandemic situation? So how do we, oh. what are your thoughts on teachers teaching this online? This is from Jonathan. Right. Well, as you know from this experience, it's quite difficult. Um, it's a little bit easier when you've got your students with you because if you've got a small class and they, I mean, it, I do like to have it interactive and things, you know, asking them yes, no questions and getting them to vote on it um, is a really good way to, to make sure they're thinking. But actually the other thing that we've done, um, which I actually forgot to mention, but is that is um, if you go to the unplugged uh, website, then you'll notice that we actually have um, a COVID-19 link or uh, which goes to these at-home activities. And so we've developed a whole set of activities here that students can do at home and the guides for them. So here's the parity one that you've probably seen. Uh, we've, we've got photographs showing you exactly what to do for a parent. So, you, so these quotes, this is what the parent says. You can see what, what's happening and so on. Um, and this gives an um, information to enable them to do these things at home. So um, that, that's um, if it's you doing it online, it may be that you can encourage them to do it with a friend or a parent or someone else who's, who's with them. Uh, yeah. So we've especially, <laughs> especially done that because of the situation. <laughs> right. I think that's a question with a lot of teachers would have. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm the next question is that. from... <laughs> Yeah, so the next question is from Jam. Uh, what happens when, and this is on the sorting network, what happens mm -hmm. when one pair of, among the children make a mistake? Ah. How easy is it for them to discover this on their own? Mm. Um, that's the whole issue of making mistakes, I think is a really important one. Um, the first thing is that we, we're not trying to teach them the algorithm, we're not trying to teach them how to get it perfect each time. We want them to learn. And so ideally you want to work out how are they going to learn from this mistake? Uh, so quite often when I see a mistake being made, I allow them to finish. And in the sorting network, they won't be in the correct order. Uh, and so we have to think, did you do something wrong? You know, what, what happened? Um, <laughs> and send them back and they have to be very careful. And 
Um, it also encourages them to keep an eye on each other, to look after each other, because um, another thing that often happens is one student will race ahead, they think they know what they're doing, and they don't give anyone else a chance to, to look at things. And so they have to learn, no, it's a team, we all want to do this together. And, and so just to encourage them to think like that as well about the process. Uh, so yeah, it is a challenge. And um, that example I showed played with the bells, um, a lot of students really struggle to hear which bell is the high note and the low note. Um, so we get a lot of mistakes there. But you notice that we had a helper. Um, and so if the students weren't sure, they could ask someone to help them. It's, I think it's a good learning situation for them to acknowledge that they might not be sure, but the, the helper who might be a teacher or a senior student can actually help them to, to listen or to, if they're comparing numbers and they're not sure, ask them the right questions to break the problem down. Yeah. So it's a, it's a slightly vague answer, but I do want to encourage you to, to let the students figure out what they're doing wrong. Um, rather than see it as teaching them to do it the right way. Yeah. Thanks. The next question is, uh, who teaches CS in schools in New Zealand? Are these the math ah. teachers or are they teachers who have been trained on computer, computer science? Right. Um, it's neither of those. Uh, so in the primary schools in particular, uh, as is the case in most countries, the, the teachers are general teachers and they the same teacher will teach maths and english and um, geography um, and so they are now having to learn how to teach computer science uh, it's the actual topic here is in new zealand is called digital technologies for historical reasons uh, in the high schools there are specialist teachers uh, but they haven't necessarily i think a very small percentage certainly less than half of those teachers have a, a qualification in computer science. Um, many of them have learnt, uh, you know, on the job, uh, and it's been a bit difficult because I think a lot of people in administration think that um, any young person knows how to do computer science. You know, they're young, they know how to use a computer. It must be easy, uh, but. Of course, it's not. Uh, it's one of the challenges that we have. Um, so we've had a lot of training programs, um, and my team here at Canterbury have um, run a lot of programs to help teachers get up to speed. But we also get teachers who convert from other areas. Um, one, one area that we get a lot of teachers from is physical education, uh, because as they get a little older, they can't run around quite as fast with the students and they're looking <laughs> for something else to do. Uh, but, you know, generally teachers quite enjoy learning this, but it, they need time. They need time to figure it out. And it can take a few years of experience to, to really get up to speed with that. Um, in other countries, of course, they're required to have a degree before they can teach the subject. And in some ways that's, that's better. But in some ways, the way that we have teachers learning as they go is that they can see it from the point of view of their students that you know they are having to understand this stuff and therefore they're having to think about you know how can i how can i best explain this i've only just started to understand it myself and sometimes that's a good place to be teaching from great thanks i think the next question is from manish uh, should we teach mathematics in parallel with computational thinking and if mm. we, if so uh, what's a good way to go about doing it Right. Um, I mean, mathematics is obviously a big part of it. Um, and a lot of the things I've demonstrated today involved mathematics. But there are other parts um, of computer science that really aren't about mathematics, but are about design. Um, and in particular, when we think about interface design, it's mainly about psychology. So it's very hard to pigeonhole it into a particular area. But if you can combine it with mathematics, then there's certainly it can really work well in both ways. Um, so for example, when you have uh, graphics being drawn and Scratch is a very popular language, if the cat is moving around and turning angles, very quickly the students want to know, oh, if it turns left and then left and then left again, what angle does it have to be? You know, And, and it's such an easier way to teach geometry when they're writing programs that do it because it's not the teacher telling them that it's meant to add up to 360. It's the cat moving on the screen that if you don't make it add up to 360, it ends up in the wrong place. So it's really good to be able to combine them. Um, but it's it's not all about maths and it, you know th th there are other aspects as well. Um, so, uh, and then what, how you can combine it obviously depends on the way that the school is structured. Um, yeah. 
So uh, I think we have probably time for one or two more questions, and I think I have mm-hmm. lots of them. So we'll probably get back uh-huh. to people with answers. But here's a difficult one for you, Tim. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gopal has asked for your opinion on Dijkstra's cruelty on really teaching computer science. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I mean, Dijkstra has written some very thought-provoking material, uh, and of course. At one point, he advocated, um, you know, leaving programming. You know, once you've written a program, you don't need to put it on a computer to to know that it works. Um, but I think the nature of computing has changed a lot. Um, a lot of what we do with computers now is about designing interfaces for people. And of course, particularly when Dijkstra was doing a lot of that writing, the interface, the, the human was less important part of the equation. And so um, when we think about the psychology of interface design, when we think about working in teams on a software engineering project and so on, uh, we're talking about how a whole lot of things that are way beyond just proving things correct or, um, you know, the, the algorithmic side of computer science. Uh, so I, I think it's thought provoking, but, and, and I, we could talk all day about it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but what people actually need in programming. We have to be careful we don't completely forget all the formal side of it because we want our programs to work accurately, but we also don't want to be so formal that you know we, we never do anything um, you know, unless it's sort of provably correct and so on. Yeah. I'm sorry to throw a googly your way. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so this was the very last question I think we can take for today. Uh, mm. some, uh, Shri, Pada, Shri Padma has asked, uh, while this is okay for high school, uh, mid to high school students, what about senior students, uh, grade grade 11, grade 12, uh, or undergraduates? How would you, what are your thoughts mm. on that? Yeah. Um, the interesting thing I've found is that this was all designed, I mean, I, I was working with a class of um, five, six, seven-year-olds originally, but then I realized that actually my students um, in, at university quite enjoyed it. Uh, and so I quite often use some of this material almost in the same form um, in a university class. But instead of it being the whole lesson, it will be a five minute quick activity at the start of the lesson. Or maybe actually one thing I quite enjoy doing is having a break in the middle of a lesson. So they come in and they're, they're you know, reading and learning about things and so on in a lecture. And then we just say, let's take a break. I want six people to come down the front and try this out or do this or whatever. And it, it really gives them a nice break. It gets them thinking about things. Uh, I can ask them much harder questions than I would ask a, um, a primary school student. And uh, so, and then in fact, I've used it for adults. Uh, you know, we, in fact, one of the most useful audiences I ever had was our Minister of Education. Uh, I was speaking to some officials, and I said, I want five of you to come up the front uh, and do the binary number activity. And our Minister of Education came up and <laughs> was held card number eight. And I asked all the questions. And again, it's, instead of telling the officials this is a good idea, I showed them, and they did it. And afterwards, she she was talking to me, and she said, this is really good. Um, we should be teaching this in the schools. And I thought, because she'd actually done it, instead of having people tell her it was a good idea. She actually understood what it was. And I've also used it for senior citizens. They really enjoy it too, because they think young people know all about computers and suddenly they know some things that young people don't. Okay, I think we've run out of time. Uh, Mm. uh, I think we can go on and on, but uh, so let me uh, thank Tim for an excellent talk. It was inspiring and I'm sure teachers can't wait to try out activities that you have shown today. Thank you for joining us all the way from Christchurch. Uh, I think it will take us a while to get used to the world being upside down, the way you showed it to us. <laughs> Thanks to all the audience for attending the webinar. Yeah. If your questions could not be taken up, I'm sorry for that. We'll reply to them over email. Uh, you can access this presentation and the recording using the same registration link from tomorrow. And please look forward to announcement of our next webinar. Until then, goodbye. Thank you for your time. <laughs>